Thank you so much. And if you'll take your seats, we'll resume. Our first presenter will be Professor Shin Kawashima, who's professor of the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences at Tokyo University. Formerly, he taught at uh, Hokkaido University. And just to mention one book uh, uh, that he did, uh, he did The Formation of Chinese Modern uh, Diplomacy, which was a prize-winning book in Japan. <clears throat> and he is really a leading China specialist uh, in Japan. Second presenter is Dr. Lung Chi Chong, who is Associate Research Fellow at the Institute of Taiwan History at the Academia Sinica in Taipei. Uh, he uh, is a, has research interests relating uh, to Taiwan and uh, was, by the way, a PhD from the uh, HEAL program here at Harvard, uh, History of East Asian Languages. And he will be presenting on Taiwan. So our first speaker's presentation will be China's nation building and critical junctures of modern Sino-Japanese relations. And Professor Chang will be talking about a silent revolution, state building, and democratization in Taiwan. Our third presenter is Professor Keiko Tamura, who's professor of the Graduate School of Social Studies at the University of Kita Kyushu. Uh, she has a number of books uh, relating to Singapore, and her special areas are Singapore and Malaysia. And she'll be talking about nation building in Singapore, the authoritarian structure of a vulnerable city state. And our final presenter will be Professor Nobuhiro Aizawa, who's an associate professor of, in the Department of Cultural Studies of Kyushu University. He works on Southeast Asian politics, and in particular, Indonesian politics. Uh, he's recently done a piece on peace and institution building, Japan in Southeast Asia, and he will be talking about building and integrating the Indonesian state. So in this panel, we'll be carrying forward with the keynote address by uh, Professor Tanaka and really looking at cases to explore his theories. I'll discuss it. May I just quickly uh, introduce him uh, now? Professor Dwight Perkins of Harvard University, of the Harold Hitchings Burbank uh, Research Professor of Political Economy on the faculty uh, here and a uh, PhD in economics from Harvard. He has been director of the Asia Center here and also director of the Harvard Institute for International Development. He's the author of more than 20 books and 100 articles on the economic history and development of China, Korea, Vietnam, and East Asia, and also has extensive experience in Indonesia, and in fact has been an advisor to governments in a number of, uh, of Asian countries. So <clears throat> he's author of many books, but let me now uh, stop and we'll turn things over to our ba uh, panel, beginning with Professor Kawashima. Thank you, Professor Susan Fro, and uh, it's my great honor to be here to discuss the wider program. Um, in this project, I uh, will write uh, two chapters. Uh, one chapter is about the uh, Asian history in 19th century, all of Asia. And the second role is writing about the uh, Chinese history in 20th century. Um, originally, I uh, would like to talk on the uh, uh, critical junctures of uh, sino japanese relations in 19th century. And I made a presentation at the Tokyo uh, before summer, maybe. Uh, however, afterwards, uh, I received the uh, proposal of discussion uh, by, from the, maybe, Professor Susan Farm, uh, like that. Uh, in the uh, 1960s and 70s, Asia lagged. Uh, there was much political instability, and economically, many Asian countries were LDCs, uh, landlocked development countries. Uh, fast forward to the current era, looking to the f uh, future, no civil war in East Asia and Southeast Asia since early 1990s, uh, great prosperity. Uh, today, relatively speaking, Asia is a region of peace. By uh, 2030, Asia's share of the world economy will be 50 pounds. How can we explain this? Big question. Yes. However, yeah, I I like to answer this question. Yes, as 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 possible as I can, but I only have 20, 12 minutes here now. <laughs> it's, uh, 
It's impossible, maybe, but uh, yes, I'll talk on this problem. Yeah. But I have so I have to skip the conclusion, yeah, you know, because I only have twelve, 12 minutes. It's it's impossible. Okay, so uh, yes. Uh, first of all, why did China lag uh, in 1956 or 70? The one factor, the input factor, is the uh, serious damages by the Sino-Japanese war, okay, after 19, uh, 1937 or 31 the Manchuria incident, and also the damage of the uh, Chinese civil war between uh, CCP and KMT before and after 1949. This is a big problem. Uh, except for such damages, uh, I have to uh, mention the other factor that the uh, hot war in the East Asia, hot war. I know you, you maybe use the Cold War, but uh, in East Asia, there are so many wars in 1950 uh, and 60s or 70s. It's a big problem. Around China, there were the Korean War and the uh, conflict with Taiwan, Taiwan, IOs, IOs in Taiwan and the Taiwan Strait or other coastal area, and in China War or Vietnam War. And after 90, uh, late 1950s, there were happened in a uh, border conflict be, uh, between China and India and others. So there are so many yeah, uh, wars and conflicts around China. China has to, has to yes, uh, use the resources uh, to such wars at the time. And secondly, uh, we, I have to point out the uh, confusing of, of the social state or nation building uh, of PLC at the time. Yes, as you know, the uh, Great Leap Forward Movement after, uh, in the uh, uh, late 1950s and Cultural Revolution after 1966 uh, 60, 60, influenced on the national building, city building of the uh, Chinese national society. Yes. Um, however, as you know, uh, after 1949, Chinese government, PLC government, successfully done, penetrated into the basement of society. So Chinese government, PLC, could control the uh, basement of society. As you know, KMT or Qin Dynasty could not penetrate into the rural level of society. Qin Dynasty only reached to the prefectural level. This is a big change. China, PLC government, or CCP, use the uh, administrative connection and the uh, political party, CCP, and the PLA. Three, yes, uh, routes. Uh, use three routes to uh, control the uh, basement society. Um, and also China, PLC government, uh, made, yes, the deep militarization of the basement society. As in after uh, mid 19th centuries, uh, so-called militarization was advanced in China. However, PLC government successfully made the de uh, uh, imperialization at that time. And also, I have to uh, point out the PLC government solved so-called drug problem, opium problem. Okay. Uh, maybe until 1960, 50 60s, I think. Yeah, this is also the good condition toward the uh, next uh, development after 1970s, uh, 80s. Yes. And in the uh, uh, 1970s, uh, yes, the uh, situation was changed, as you know. But uh, I. Before I talk on about the 1970s situation, I have to mention one thing. Yeah, in 1960s, okay, uh, so-called China-Soviet split was started. Maybe in uh, 1959 or 1962. There are so many uh, explanation. In 1964-64, Mao Zedong, Mao Takto in Japanese, Mao Zedong in Chinese, uh, started one policy, the third line. Okay movement. Because uh, China was faced with the, some uh, ec external threat, <laughs> and, uh, and, and Mao Zedong decided the concentrate, to concentrate the uh, resources into the inner China, 
because coastal China area was yeah, sub, well, facing was this external threat. So in 1960s, the center of industry moved to the central area at the time. As you know, after 1980s, the center of industrial uh, industry of China moved to the coastal area, okay, under the reform policy uh, by Don Shopi. So, uh, Sino Japanese, uh, Sino Soviet split, or the so uh, big uh, factor to influence Chinese nation building. Especially in a uh, uh, Damansky incident in 1916, influenced on Chinese uh, decision making and Chinese uh, state building at the time. Okay, uh, after the 1969, China changed and uh, adjusted its uh, leftist policy under the Cultural Revolution, and after 1969 or 70, adopted the uh, yes modest foreign policy toward Western countries. China uh, approaches US, USA and made a normalization of diplomatic relations with Canada in 1970, Japan in 1972, and Germany also, and made normalization with USA in 1979. And as you know, in 1972, China changed its economic policy okay, on the textile industry and the fertilization industries and so on. And in the mid 19th century, the agri agricultural industry was also changed so drastically. So called Green Revolution was happening in China before the deforming policy by Deng Xiaoping. At this point, I don't know, in 1978, yes, Deng Xiaoping studied the reforming policy. That's right. However, before it, before Deng Xiaoping, the reforming policy, there were happened some changes in China. And after the end of Vietnam War and the uh, Sino Vietnam War in 1979, okay, before the uh, uh, end of the Vietnam War and the uh, uh, Sino Vietnam War, so called hot war, hot war in East Asia, were mostly ended, especially for Cambodians' conflicts. This factor, the end of the hot war in East Asia, was uh, good big condition toward the Chinese economic development. Uh, China could move industrial move uh, resources from inner China to coastal China. Okay, coastal China. And however, the Soviet split was continued and the Com Cambodia problem was so important for China in the diplomatic phase. Okay? China was still deliberate to advance the reforms uh, policy. At that time, Japan was the most reliable partner of, Jap of China, and Japan can share, because Japan shared the same stance on Cambodia problem with China at that time. So Nakasone and Huyaban, okay, they had good relations at the time, and uh, until 19, uh, until 1986, maybe. And however, I have to point out one thing that after 1979, China adopted one child policy for its development, but it became a heavy load, big burden uh, for the development of China in 21st century now. Okay. I think 1989 was the so-called critical juncture for Chinese development after 1949. The Sino-Soviet split was ended in 1989. Okay, as you know, the Mr. Gorbachev visited China on May, okay, before the Tiananmen Square incident. On, uh, on May 1989. So after the end of China, uh, China split, uh, China uh, can move the resources from inner China to coastal area, area. And also, uh, China can move, could move the, some 
uh, military resources at the border area between Soviet, China, uh, uh, Soviet and China to the coastal area. It was a big change. And the Tiananmen Square incident was also happening in 1989. Uh, on this point, China showed its policy, okay, non-democratized non uh, policy. But at that time, Taiwan and, uh, as you know, mid, after mid-1980s, Taiwan and South Korea adopted the uh, policy for democratization. But at the Tiananmen Square incident, China, yes, adopted, other, uh, adopted another way. Okay. And the Cold War, Cold War was ended in 1989. But the interesting, okay, the end, before the end of the Cold War, China adopted the, the policy to adjust the inflation. And also China controlled the society so strongly because of the Tiananmen Square incident. So although there's so many socialist country Yes, change its political system under the domino phenomena. However, China CCP government could keep its political yes, system at the time. However, facing with the crisis of a socialist country, China strengthened the legitimacy, PLC, P, not PLC, CCP strengthened its legitimacy in, in China. And also, CCP rebuilt, rebuilt its legitimacy in China under the movement of, yes, uh, some, uh, I go to uh, the patriotism um, uh, in China, and so on. So 1989 was the critical juncture, I think, for the 21st century. So uh, for the future, now that uh, China is the second largest economic power in the world, and also China, yes, is still a non-democratic country, yeah, I don't know the future, as Tanaka has said. However, it's so important for China whether, whether China can have initiative on the next technological innovations or not. It's a big problem for China now. As you know, for China, population aging problem is so crucial for its development for 2030s, maybe. So that China has to advance its technological innovation now. So technological innovation is strongly combined with the big, the most largest problem for China, just an aging problem. So China is so eager to advance the technological innovation now. Okay. So the uh, Don Xiaoping's one-child policy has now influenced. Uh, if so influential to the, the development in the 21st century. Yes, I just described the uh, Chinese, okay, uh, the processes of the Chinese state of building after 1949 for 12 minutes. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Professor Kawashima. And our next presenter is Dr. Chang. Okay, sure. Okay, sure. Uh, good afternoon. It's really uh, my great pleasure to be back to Cambridge. Uh, after uh, graduate for so many years. I would like to first express my uh, sincere thanks to the JIA colleagues and, uh, and also my prestigious teammates uh, in the past two years. Uh, as, a, as an overseas member of this team, uh, I, I, uh, great, I really uh, learned a lot as a Taiwanese historian. Uh, but it also uh, constitutes a huge challenge for me to, uh, to face up to uh, this text of uh, uh, parallel history because uh, I think the challenge is threefold. One is like I'm not an IR specialist and, and I'm not a political uh, scientist, so I don't have any theoretical uh, driven uh, or uh, any theoretical background in uh, constitute this kind of problem. And secondly, uh, this is not a compilation of area specialists. So I, we actually uh, work together in a, a kind of a holistic uh, framework and try to dialogue uh, in a, in a trans transnational way. So I need to somehow move 
uh, out of my uh, comfort zone as a Taiwan uh, historian or area specialist. And thirdly, and most, uh, most importantly, because my spe specialist is actually uh, on late 19th century and early 20th century, so how to discuss contemporary Taiwan uh, with all, uh, the leading, leading scholars in Japan is actually um, a, a great challenge to me. So, uh, so my paper, uh, although mostly completed, is still uh, uh, a section is missing, that is conclusion. So, uh, so that's, uh, uh, with this uh, apology, I would uh, start uh, by introducing to you uh, the three major uh, key uh, component or keywords of my paper instead of uh, going into details uh, within 12 minutes. Uh, the first key, uh, let, me, let me talk about my, uh, uh, my take on this, uh, the key notion of state building. Uh, I, I'm actually, actually taking a, a more or less an eclectic uh, fashion uh, in, in this term uh, by, first of all, take a, a long-term historical view by tracing uh, Taiwan's historical, uh, Taiwan state building, uh, not in a uh, post-war period, but uh, all the way to late 19th century, uh, the late Qing period. And, and then also uh, recognize the, the very important uh, period of Japanese colonial rule and colonial state building, infrastructure building and, and others as a, pre, uh, as a condition for the post-war period. And also uh, for the uh, post -war, most of the post-war period, which is uh, very familiar to uh, all, all uh, uh, the specialist interest in Taiwan, especially uh, the 50, 60, and uh, 70, and, and all the way to the 18th period, uh, I'm uh, taking a kind of a state-centered approach by uh, that uh, by uh, emphasizing uh, the importance of state capacity, state autonomy, and also the importance of austerian regime in initiating uh, economic development and other uh, important affairs. But for, uh, for the period after uh, 1987, uh, the, the post, um, uh, the lifting of martial law period, I think the state center approach is no longer applicable. So I'm, I'm actually uh, trying to adopt the, the insights from the state in society approach by uh, emphasizing the embeddedness of the state action and state uh, initiative, and also the importance of the imaginings and practice of state actors and, and their interaction with societies. So with this, uh, uh, with this, in, uh, with this uh, pre uh, in mind, let me just uh, very quickly go to the main point of my uh, pa uh, paper. Uh, as far as uh, the, the Taiwan State Building is concerned, I think it is, uh, uh, it's actually, uh, if we take a long-term historical pr perspective, then they're actually uh, experiencing different forms of the building from the late Qing uh, self strengthening movement to the Japanese colonial period uh, to the tr uh, transitional period, uh, which has been called the accidental state by some scholars uh, in his recent work uh, because of the uncertainty of the KMT regime, uh, Kuomintang regime, and the ROC, uh, Republic of Chi China, uh, from, uh, the, during the period when they uh, um, migrated from uh, China to Taiwan, and also the most uh, famous period of authoritarian rule and the developmental stage. But uh, my focus actually focused on the, the more recent period, which is uh, the democratic state building or the, the process of democratization, which is the second keywords of my uh, paper and also the, the major case of my, my analysis. Uh, for those familiar with uh, Taiwan's process of democratization, I think uh, the story of 1970s has been uh, widely known. So my, uh, actually my uh, analysis is focused more on the post martial law period, in, uh, especially during the uh, 1990 to 1996, when uh, uh, the, uh, the government uh, under the President Li Zhenghui initiated seven, uh, a series of seven constitutional revisions that uh, greatly restructures uh, the, the, uh, the governmental structure and also the, the governing ideology of the, uh, the, the ROC in Taiwan. And there's also a very important uh, case of three regime chains within the period of two decades, and how uh, this uh, was brought about, and what is the significance of this regime change, uh, is also a very uh, important part of my discussion. So uh, I consider democratization not only as a historical process or a kind of idea or values, but also a, a very important integrative mechanism in linking the settler state and with the native uh, state of ROC uh, with 
the uh, native uh, Taiwanese society, and how this uh, integrated function of democratization actually uh, played a key role in post martial law Taiwan. And my third key term is actually the topic of silent revolution. The term silent revolution, or in Ningjing Geming in Mandarin, was coined to describe the so smooth and peaceful election, relatively speaking, uh, uh, of the regime change of Taiwan that stood in sharp contrast to the political violence of military coup elsewhere in Asia, in Latin America, and in Africa. So uh, uh, if we follow the, uh, the classic definition of Max Weber, Taiwan is now a nation with a population of 23 million, a well-defined territory, a functioning government with limited, if not decreasing, international recognition. So as an emergent uh, nation state, Taiwan is now a political community with a common identity and common system of political and legal rights and obligations. And based on the principle of political sovereignty, all citizens of Taiwan now has been controlling the state through a democratic institution or, of election and self-government. Uh, this rosy, rosy picture of uh, so-called uh, silent uh, revolution, uh, mostly uh, uh, applicable in uh, 1990s and, uh, uh, and maybe part, part of the early 21st century is now serious in question because of the changing uh, geopolitical situation and also the, the, uh, the intensification of national de uh, identity debate along with other uh, issues such as uh, sustainable growth, environmental protection, human rights, and other uh, new uh, challenges I think uh, the democratic uh, consolidation or the, the, uh, the functioning of the democratic state in Taiwan is, is now being uh, seriously not only challenged but questioned. So, uh, so I'm looking forward actually to looking forward to, uh, uh, to the panel discussion and the Q&A session uh, and the contribution of floor the floor to, for me to uh, at least to write up my conclusion. Uh, of this paper. And to sum up, uh, let me just sum up uh, my uh, presentation in the following uh, table. And after successfully experiencing democratic uh, re transition through what historian uh, Eric Hosborn calls the age of extremes, uh, Taiwan now not only faced new domestic challenge of sustainable growth, welfare reform, transitional justice, and historical reconciliation, but also need to deal with increasing difficult geopolitical uh, conditions and serious new threats from without. How to reduce cross-strait tensions and promote regional peace and collaboration demands the best collective wisdom and genuine efforts of politicians, civic workers, and peoples on the island. The consolidation of the democratic state of Taiwan will certainly, uh, if successful, will certainly contribute to the prosperity and stability in 21st century Asia. And let me uh, quickly show uh, my PowerPoint and, and just give you a sense how this uh, small island has been transformed rapidly within the uh, few decades from an authoritarian rule to a now a democratic, um, a model dem democracy in the Chinese society. Let the picture speak for himself. And this is actually now uh, most influential uh, media, so-called PTT in Taiwan, that uh, uh, is influencing the current ongoing uh, election uh, by providing uh, alternative channels uh, uh, compared to uh, the, the mainstream media, uh, which I'm also uh, unfamiliar with. It, it was actually introduced by my son and my students. <laughs> OK, thank you very much for your attention. So thank you very much to Dr. Chung, and we'll now turn to Professor Tamura, uh, and she'll be uh, <clears throat> uh, joining us up here. Yes, thank you.
Hi, everybody. I will talk about how Singapore has achieved domestic stability and stable international environment very briefly. Singapore's rapid economic growth since the 1960s and the inf immense influence of the ruling People's Action Party over all political, economic, and social sectors of the nation might be a well-known story. This heavy-handed political system has been rationalized on the ground that Singapore, unlike other countries in Southeast Asia, is a vulnerable city-state. Why does the PAP government claim that Singapore is a vulnerable city-state? Firstly, Singapore is a tiny, small, small country, you see, with an area slightly bigger than the 23 walls of Tokyo. Secondly, it is home to Chinese, 74%, Malay 13%, India 9%, and others. This feature has given Singapore the distinction as the only country in the Southeast Asian region where Chinese are in the majority. Thirdly, Singapore was separated from Malaysia and got independence in 1965. Many disputes between the sta then state government, Singapore state government and the Malaysian central government have made Malaysia a potential enemy of independent Singapore, though water and food stock come from Malaysia every day. Lastly, Singapore's economy is very, very fragile and is greatly affected by global economy and global financial system as its degree of dependence of foreign trade is very huge. This vulnerability makes Singapore's elite, the PAP top political leaders, very sensitive to the danger of instability. You know, there is no express provision in Singapore's constitution stating that sovereignty resides in the people. This could be regarded as reflecting the country's vulnerability and the maintenance of the state as one of the most important constitutional principles. But it could also be the government intention to show that, that, it, that, to show that the leadership of the state lies with it, not with the people. The government has restricted and controlled the forces of political criticism, such as opposition parties, the mass media, and other forces that could be critical of the government. For example, the charismatic first prime minister, Lee Kuan Yew, always told publicly that press freedom must be subordinated to the primacy of purposes of the elected government. The government's last but most powerful political weapon is still Internal Security Act. Any people who are regarded as dangerous could be detained for an indefinite period. I should also mention briefly Singapore's success of management was controlling ethnic diversity. Singapore embraced multicultural policy with differences within the new nation administratively limited to the ethnic boxes, Chinese, Malay, Indian and other CMIO categories. And these four ethnic groups are officially accorded equal treatment within the national space, be it in terms of economic participation, education, or religious and cultural expression and practices. To preserve the CMIO boundaries, the government enforces a strict bureaucratic separation among the groups by determining a citizens' identity by paternal line. Therefore, all Singaporeans are supposed to have only one unchanging ethnic identity. For example, Chinese. Chinese Singaporean, I mean, Chinese are encouraged to dress, eat, and dance in the so-called traditional Chinese manner. And they are requires to take Chinese language as their second language in school, although English is the first language for all. 
There are laws and acts to ban words and conduct promoting feeling of ill will between the different ethnic groups. Ethnicity is thus carefully defined, packaged, and managed through the state action intervention to ensure that multicultural harmony is maintained. Let me proceed to another factor concerning domestic stability, economic success, and good governance. Singapore has achieved a level of affluence that ranks it tenth globally in per capita GDP. This rapid economic growth has been pulled mainly by multinational corporations and government-linked companies. And 80% of Singaporeans live in public housing and nearly 80% of these people own their house. They own their flat they live in. This housing policy has drawn worldwide attention. Singapore scores high in economic and institutional transparency in the world. A high standard of living and good governance have contributed to Singapore's domestic stability, though social security network is still very poor. Control and comfort, these opposing words, can explain lack of protest. These control and comfort, comfort policies have been pushing people from politics. Yes, there are some Singaporeans who know deep down that there is something wrong in their politics, but who will not do anything about it. This is quite natural. Most people would prefer to mind their own business, family, school, and leaving government to the professional class of administration and politicians. As for international stability, I am sure you still remember the historic summit between US President Trump and North Korean leader Kim Jong-un was held in Singapore. This year, why Singapore agrees to host this summit in spite of short preparation period and paying all the expenses of the North Korean delegation? On achieving independence, Singapore declared a foreign policy of non-alignment and neutral, offers to work with all the countries that would recognize her territorial integrity and sovereignty, and advertising her advertising her desire to trade with any nations, including communist countries. The then Prime Minister Lee stated, we can trade even with devils. Singapore has had strategic alliance with the US since independence and has had significant economic tie with China. When China and Singapore established diplomatic relations in 1990, Singapore's leaders also had an agreement with their Chinese counterparts on the need for the Singapore Armed Forces to continue military training in Taiwan. Singapore used to send more than 15,000 servicemen a year to Taiwan for military training. Because of such good relations with China and Taiwan, Singapore hosted a historic cross trade talk between China and Taiwan twice. Singapore also hosted the Shangri-La Dialogue, Asia's top defense summit since its first meeting in 2002. Based on the strength of this achievement, Singapore wants to be a summit city in Asia, advertising her foreign policy of non-alignment, neutral, and domestic stability. This is her survival policy to engage in the international community and to promote a peaceful international environment. Times, however, is changing. Domestically, after the founding father Lee passed away three years ago, the era of a powerful state deciding everything is already drawing to a close. The government has not offered any fundamental prescription to either public dissatisfaction and anxiety about widening income disparities, fragile safety net, growing numbers of foreign migrants. Because of low fertility rate and the shortage of workers, the government has welcomed tens of thousands of foreign workers 
every year since the 1990s. At the same time, people have come forward who refuse to bow down to the government designs. Instead, they become working to create a society that they themselves desire and seek Singaporean identity beyond CMIO categories. Though they are still such a small number, but I can still say there are new moves underway at last in Singapore to allow society to build a state, not the other way around. <coughs> At the international environment, it seems that China has begun to put pressure on Singapore over its long-standing military cooperation with Taiwan and indirectly for its security relationship with the United States. Last December, Singapore Armed Forces vehicles en route from Taiwan to Singapore were seized in Hong Kong. The Hong Kong Authority did not show any reason, but many believe that Peijing was behind the scene. The Golden Times, a patriotic Chinese newspaper, accused Singapore like this, forgetting its origins, a small country that should remember its place. Although, Thai, although China might have intended to put pressure on the new president of Taiwan, who may seek independence, Singapore now feels constrained ability to tuck between the two major powers. Singapore Armed Forces training might be conducted in Australia in the near future. The PAP government may face a domestic as well as an international critical turning point soon again. Thank you. So we've had presentations on China, Taiwan, Singapore, and now we turn to Indonesia. We have a presentation by Professor, uh, Professor Aizawa, who will now join us here. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Susan Farr, and thank you very much uh, for everyone. Uh, who work, work together in this two-year project. And also, thank you very much for inviting me to the conference, uh, both uh, for JIIA and for uh, Harvard University. Um, my name is Aizawa Nobuhiro from Kyushu University. I study on uh, Southeast Asian politics, especially on Indonesia and Thailand. And today, I would like to talk about Indonesia. I'm sorry, I don't have any power or point, and therefore that's why I have no PowerPoint. <laughs> and if you're familiar with this joke, you're very much well a Southeast Asian, Asianist too. <laughs> um, so uh, the question uh, uh, Dr. T uh, Tanaka and Dr. Farr has raised will require pretty much a three full semester course to answer, but uh, let me do it in 12 minutes. Um, I basically will like very much simplify into three points. Um, first, uh, why the peace? Why the peace in Asia? And from an Indonesian point of view, um, if I have to write a, for example, counterfactual history, I mean, Indonesia could always be the epicenter of destabilization. You know, you can name anything, uh, starting from the Sukarno period up until the uh, the current time too. Um, but why didn't that counterfactual history didn't happen? Um, there's, of course, this internal, as Tana, Tanaka Sensei said, there was the state capacity in terms of um, you know, uh, managing the internal uh, equilibrium. And that's the first point. Um, how, how did Indonesia kept themselves peace was actually how Indonesia maintained its unity. Um, Indonesia, you might know, it's a very multi-ethnic, multi-religious, very complicated society. Um, if you have traveled there, there's no, uh, you, can, you can hardly understand any standard of Indonesia. I mean, it's so different in wherever you visit in Indonesia. But how did you manage the national unity? Um, since the beginning of Republic, um, it was always uh, the challenge of fragmentation was there. Um, you know, there was... There were so many, um, you know, versions of, of Indonesian state. It could be a communist state, it could be an Islamic state, it could be a federal state, but it was a republican state. And it remained up until now. Uh, and that, that itself is a remarkable history. But the critical juncture I want to 
pinpoint today because I think the question I was raised was post-1990. Um, the critical juncture of how the unity of Indonesia was challenged was really much on 1998 um, economic crisis. Um, you might have already forgotten, but 20 years before, Indonesia was considered to be at the brink of balkanization. Um, you know, the, in the 1990, there was actually the balkanization in Yugoslavia. Um, many people consider there are so many, um, you know, similar facts to think or to anticipate that same thing happens in Indonesia. If I was the president, it might be that way, but there were wise men in Indonesia that didn't happen. So, And how did Indonesia do it? Uh, it responded with a way of two things. One is democratization, and also importantly is uh, decentralization. It was two in tandem that maintained, or that was the reaction to the internal uh, equilibrium, as uh, Dr. Tanaka-sensei said. Well, democratization. Um, so first step was, you know, there was only three parties, which was not, never a fair, never a free election in 1997. And in 1999 election, there was 48 parties. You, know, you can at least consider the kind of inclusiveness or the, the participation uh, door, how open it was in the 1998. It, it kept on up until now. We, um, and, and very interestingly, like, like many people, election get boring. Right? If too much election, it get boring. But uh, this year, even in the local election, the voting turnout rate is 75%. Um, in, a, in a provincial uh, election. And I was very fascinated to see all these Indonesian people dressed up on election, right? Dressed up like in a Superman costume or this, you know. So, so what, what it means is that election is not anymore just an administrative process. It's now a festival. It's now a culture, right? So it become much more identified as a Indonesian culture rather than just a system. So I think, um, to, to make the story f very fast, I think that part of democratization really uh, kind of gave a stabilization in reaction to this dynamic society that Indonesia has. The other part is decentralization. Um, decentralization was very radical too in Indonesia. Um, we still need a lot of research why the centralization took place, but the fact is there was, for example, 26 province and 298, you know, the kind of uh, sub-region and city uh, administrative units. That jumped to 34 a uh, province and 508 um, sub-region and local governments. So before Indonesia was governed by two million, almost two million central government bureaucrats, but now we only have one million bureaucrats, central bureaucrats, it's half. And then the local government bureaucrats is triple, no, not triple, I'm sorry, 0 0.5 million to 3.3, so it's six, sixfold. So you'll see who is the state, or who is, what is the state? It's not anymore a central state, but it's a local state, right? And the budget is also the same. So they radically change it to the decentralized form of governance. And with that two together, what was very important was the local election was uh, actively done in a direct election. And that was the way the Indonesian identity politics was tamed. Indonesia was, when balkanization was at stake, everybody thought about identity politics will be there from throughout the archipelago, but actually, you know, f you know, the fragmented society was tamed by this decentralized election with decentralized bureaucracy, and that made all these ad identity politic leaders attracted to join the state rather than fighting on street, right? So it could have been, if the centralized system was still as it was in the Suharto period, Maybe they will fight for a lot of uh, you know, um, off-election fightings. But what happened was because the budget, the position, the, the, the kind of uh, um, state, you know, uh, uh, um, whatever interest was available, uh, the fight, the identity fight was not anymore about the fight over unit of governance, but it was just about fight for a, maybe a local interest or resources. So I think that really tamed the kind of social dynamic that Indonesia had. 
into uh, uh, to keep the uh, kind of governance or the state flexible and strong enough to survive. Um, that is the first point. The second point will be the international uh, condition. I think the U.S.-Japan alliance played a what, benign uh, role, as Tanaka Sensei said. Um, I could argue in many ways, but one simple thing I could not, uh, I, I want to raise is, I think Jap being Japan very stable in the past uh, 60 years was in itself created a benign environment for Indonesia. It, it's a very, um, uh, it's a very, you know, uh, kind of uh, rough comparison, but I, if we compare with like Iran, like what happened to, what happened to like Middle East, like when Iran was the junior partner for the United States and how Iran had the Islamic revolution and how much that impacted the regional dynamics, uh, while Japan was the junior partner of the United States in that period and how Japan, Japanese economic development sustained the kind of economic development, not just the model, but the continuous uh, economic cooperations and investment toward Indonesia. I think that really gave a benign environment itself. And also because of the 1985 Plaza Accord, I think that is also a very critical point because uh, countries like Indonesia, everybody know there will be a lot of resource trap. Um, that is one of the key uh, difficulties in maintaining a state with a lot of resources. Um, but what came after the resource trap when the 1980s, um, the resource revenue started to decline. Um, of course, the, the, like the U.S. You know, uh, uh, advisor like, uh, uh, and, and people in Harvard, and also, um, and also together with the Japanese investment, uh, especially um, the post-1985 uh, Plaza Accord investment flow into Southeast Asia actually did gave an assist to c pursue the type of uh, politics of economic development. Um, it, there's no counterfactual history, but as far as what happened, in, if you look at the 1980s, I think that factor, the Japanese factor, and also the fact that Japan and United States was in a line to pursue this politics of production or politics of productivity, not the kind of Sukarno revolutionary politics. I think that created a very benign environment for Indonesia um, to pursue its uh, politics and, and make sure the stability, political stability is in support by not just domestically, but also from other countries too. Um, but of course, uh, if we talk about state capacity, it's not just about the environment. It's also about the Indonesian initiative to make sure that a uh, benign environment, to, uh, if, if I could say it, to be the benefit of its own stability. Um, I will just uh, shift a little bit of the timing. I would like to, to state the type of Indonesian initiative that took place in the 21st century, because as, as uh, Professor Tanaka said, there was also a peace period in 21st century too. I think that period also in globally speaking, the war on terror by United States created a lot of destabilization factor throughout the, re throughout the world. But Southeast Asia was not a place in terms of a strong intervention of the United States. There's a lot of discussion why, um, but I think the kind of Indonesia's initiative in bringing ASEAN as a kind of a, um, a buffer was pretty much productive to, cre to make sure Southeast Asia is a secure or stable place. Um, how they do it, there's a long history, but I think um, starting from the inclusive, you know, involving into the post-Cambodian post conflict and, and Vietnam, uh, post-Vietnam, uh, you know, yeah, unification, integration of Southeast Asia. One of the key Indonesia decision was make sure we have one vote, uh, we have an equal vote system in ASEAN. I think that was a very critical decision because when Cambodia, Vietnam, Laos, and Myanmar joined ASEAN, there was a discussion whether we should put a waiting vote system or so forth. But Indonesia maintained, even though it's the biggest country, and of course there's a big gap between in terms of population, economic size, whatever, with other countries, Indonesia tried to maintain, you no, know, we have an equal voting system so that we don't isolate the newcomers as like a second class membership. That's one thing. The second thing is, of course, 
the war on terror was at the brink and Indonesia was full of terrorism. There was so many good reasons why, why Indonesia was, was not be having a military attack or, or, or intervention. But um, they pursued a kind of a, you know, even though everybody laughed about it, in ASEAN was a democratic, human right friendly region. Um, I think that kind of policy, despite everybody laughed about where's Vietnam, where's Myanmar, um, it was in, uh, the kind of diplomatic skill that they had to say that we are democratically inspired or like democrat human rights inspired uh, association of nations, you know, and make sure, make sure that non-ASEAN state, be it United States, be it Japan, be it China, don't intervene in our uh, politics was also a very key. So non-intervention among the ASEAN vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis the external members like the uh, the big great, great powers was a pure diplomatic uh, kind of intention of Indonesia at the sometimes expense of the Inter intervention to domestic affairs among the Southeast Asian countries because Indonesia was so noisy to what Vietnam is doing or what Myanmar is doing when other countries were one party system, military junta. So I think that was the Indonesian calculation. We could break those kind of inter non intervention rules within our society, but not vis a vis the, uh, not, not from the uh, external country. I think that kind of diplomatic calculation that Indonesia made created a benign environment for Indonesia to make sure the region a peaceful place. Um, thank you very much. Well, we've had four quite diverse papers, each uh, showing, uh, giving us a sense of developments in their country on the issue of why we end up with prosperity, stability, equilibrium, internal and external. And to make sense of this, we are turning things over to Professor Perkins. If that's my charge, I quit now. Uh, the, um, what I want to... Uh, want to do first is make a, a few general remarks about the approach um, uh, and then uh, talk about the specific four countries uh, not so much with the idea of critiquing the what has been said here today or the outlines that I had uh, prior to looking but more uh, looking at some of the questions I hope this project will try to, you know, the kinds of questions that I hope this project will tr uh, try to answer. Uh, and uh, I will start then by saying I think this is a great project. I think the idea of going back deep into history and, and building the, uh, the origins of the political development uh, is important for not only understanding the politics, but also understanding why these countries were able to develop economically uh, the way they had. Uh, and I'm an economist by training, uh, albeit uh, not, not a, a standard today's type of economist, but uh, I therefore, I approach this subject uh, first by sort of saying, what does it take to get sustained economic development? And at least a major part of that is you have to have a government that is clearly committed and devoted on a consistent, steady basis to economic development. And that means it has to be able to maintain stability. Uh, and, and if it, take, and if it uh, chooses certain types of strategies of development, particularly the more interventionist kinds, it also has to have a high level of discipline and competence uh, that a great many governments uh, in the developing world uh, do not have. Um, if they pick the right strata, if they therefore have that, uh, the right, uh, the strength to maintain that stability and, and to have leadership that basically concentrates on economic development, picks the right strategy or make, or if it picks the wrong strategy, changes it uh, to, to something more appropriate. Um, then uh, you are likely to get sustained uh, development. What the right strategy is, in turn, depends in part on the international environment. The international environment of the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, and 90s 
was very much open to an export-led uh, foreign trade-based uh, development. If you had started development as Latin America did in the 1910s and 20s and 30s and 40s, it would have, that strategy would not work. And, and in fact, uh, Latin America went in a different route, which caused other kinds of, of problems. So uh, in, the, in this context, uh, you know, I start by with the assumption you really cannot understand the nature of of the government unless you go back deep into history. Uh, the and I, in this context, I want to sort of take up the countries in, one by one and trying to do four countries in in uh, seven or eight minutes or whatever I have left uh, is a is a bit of a challenge. And therefore, all I'm going to do is point out. I'm going to start with the, in a sense, the countries that had the uh, most developed, uh, the strongest governments in the sense of uh, strong states with very strong, competent bureaucracies, disciplined bureaucracies, uh, and capable of, of, of a more interventionist type of, of, of development policy. And, and one looks at, uh, and in that context, Taiwan. And so one of the the first questions one has to ask about Taiwan is, okay, how did it get a government like that? Well, you know, it was the nationalist government on the mainland that went from uh, from the, controlling the mainland very uh, very incompetently to controlling Taiwan competently. It was all mainlanders running it for at least the first couple uh, decades, uh, and. Um, and it was an authoritarian system, and so on. Um, the, uh, but then the, the question is, you know, well, how is it that this government came in and made this fundamental change? Uh, what is it that led them to decide that they were going to carry out the particular economic policy they did? They actually did it a year or two ahead of Korea, which did this, a similar type of, of policy. And uh, I mean, when uh, when Li Guoting, uh, uh, KT Lee, uh, would talk about this when he would come to audiences, and people would ask, "Well, how did you do this?" His answer was very simple. He said, "Because we 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 had to. Uh, our survival depended on it. That's okay, but it's not enough. Uh, you know, what is it that led? Because the, the the economic development." specialists in those days were not saying that this strategy was going to be the ideal strategy. Many of them were writing that it was a wrong strategy to go into, uh, but they, uh, they did it. And, but, and often they came out of a state bureaucracy. A lot of the leaders in economics came from the China, the China Petroleum Corporation and so on. Um, that went. So, so again, that's a question. When you move to China, uh, and pardon me for the superficiality of, uh, of all of this, but uh, when you move to China, uh, you have uh, you know, the death of Mao. I mean, you know, China basically has a, a thousand year strong bureaucratic tradition. It has self-governance. It may have done, you know, by modern standards, be not well so self-governed for long periods of time. Uh, its ability to even think about doing a centrally planned uh, command economy. Uh, if you'd done that in many of the other countries that I've had at least some exposure to in sub-Saharan Africa, you would have had a disaster. You would also have had a disaster in Indonesia if you'd tried it. Uh, but in China, you, had, you got a disaster, but it was because of Mao's personality. Then you get uh, Deng Xiaoping and you get the uh, you get this fundamental change in, in, in policy. Uh, and I'm not going to go through that whole history, but just one question that one could ask in that context. The senior economic advisor in China in the, uh, in the early 1980s uh, was not a liberal market-oriented economist. It was Chen Yun. And Chen Yun was believed in central planning and a command economy, and he believed in using the market supplementary in a supplementary fashion, but he did not believe it should become the dominant thing. What, you know, what happens, of course, is that Zhao Ziyang and others carry out these experiments. Deng likes them. 
uh, and in the end they carry the day uh, uh, and, uh, and that moves on, a, a resistance in 1989-90 after t the Tiananmen um, uh, a f uh, a tragedy and so on. Um, so, but the question is, you know, what, you know, what was the politics that really made that work? What happened to Chen Yun in that context uh, and, the, and the conservatives? Why weren't they able to maintain control? Um, Zhao Ziyang was not such a big, powerful figure. Uh, was it just the personality of Deng Xiaoping and so on? So, but again, in these states, you could have a highly intervention. These are the states where if you talk about the flying geese pattern, which some Japanese scholars and others like to talk about, the flying geese pattern has some validity in this context. When it was tried in elsewhere in Southeast Asia, it was a disaster. Um, uh, but uh, the, the, the Japanese model of, of development, clearly in South Korea, uh, Taiwan, and to some degree China, with major differences. China put a big emphasis on foreign direct investment, for example. Then you move to Singapore. And again, you have, of course, uh, you know, Singapore is the official ideology, is a multiracial state. The reality is it's a Chinese state. Uh, and, uh, and, and the question then becomes, uh, how exactly did they get to the kind of government they had and the kind of development strategy uh, that they pursued. Uh, many, um, and it, at least part of the answer has to do with what happened with the PAP uh, and the governance of the PAP. Uh, many years ago, when I was first teaching at Harvard in 1964, 65, uh, uh, my early years of teaching, Leaders will say before most of you were born, probably. But uh, the uh, uh, I uh, with I had a student uh, from Singapore who was then a young uh, uh, a young government official in the Kennedy School, and um, we w we went together to hear Wang Gungwu, who was arguably the most preeminent historian of, of Asia and Southeast Asia, uh, and um, Wang Gungwu gave us. An art, uh, a, less, uh, a lecture on how it was likely that the Chinese-speaking majority in Singapore would ultimately come to dominate and would dominate and would therefore dominate the PAP and the leadership, and, and you would get uh, a very different kind of government than the sort of the British and the English language. Uh, uh, Chinese, uh, and, and I walked out with Niem Tan Do and. Uh, later, he later became a very high official in the, in the government, uh, and he was the English speaker. And he, he walked out and said, "Well, we've got our work cut out for us." Um, anyway, they under, in the end they un, they won the PAP for better or for worse, and we've heard from Professor, Professor Tamara that uh, that um, uh, that uh, what has happened since. Um, but again, you had the capacity to have a very activist foreign policy, but they picked a strategy that was actually quite uh, economically quite liberal, not politically, obviously. They run it the whole state like a modern corporation. Yeah, um, but in some ways, the most interesting case and the most contrasting case is Indonesia. Uh, because in Indonesia, I mean, I think to understand Indonesia at all, you've got to at least go back to uh, to the late 19th, early 20th century. Indonesia, at the time of independence, had a, a, hardly any education. The Dutch didn't even under, in, introduce primary education until the 1920s, and then for only a, a minority of, uh, of the pop, population. Uh, when you got independent, I mean, the, the official figures, they only had about 200 college graduates at the time of of, uh, of independence. Whether that figure is accurate or not, <laughs> whatever it was, it was a very tiny number. And, and you, so you, you had great difficulty building modern universities. You had, you had a bureaucracy that was, uh, that frankly, had very little competence. And this continues on for quite some time. Uh, the, but yet, you know, over time, what you get, and 
uh, Professor Ayazawa has gone into the later development, uh, but you have the sense of national identity, despite all this diversity, becomes r real. You know, some of it is, uh, you know, some of it is just the fact that it was all Dutch. Then it becomes Sukarno's foreign policy, which is, is very unproductive and leads to the lowering of standard of living of the people, but it actually gives a sense of national identity to people. And, and then you get the Suharto regime with, that achieves a sustained economic development for a period of, of uh, uh, 30, uh, 30 years or so. Uh, and then, uh, of course, you move to democratization. Now, but when you, having worked closely with that, uh, with that Saharto government, uh, you know, the issue was what kind of strategy works in that kind of context? And the government of Indonesia under Saharto in the 70s tried exactly the wrong strategy. Big state, state enterprise, state uh, interventionist, and it was a disaster. They ended up with a huge debt to, and, a, and a crisis. Uh, and at that point, the Berkeley Mafia of Wajoyo and Hollywood become dominant. And they, and they know that they look at their own ministries and they know their ministry has no competence at all. Uh, that's why they had to rely so much on Harvard for technical help. Um, and they relied to some degree on the IMF and the World Bank. The, uh, in that context, the only way you were going to develop was to basically get the government out of the way because the government didn't have the capacity to do anything. Uh, and so you, you, you uh, created an open market economy. Uh, there, was no, there were no foreign exchange controls or anything like that. You couldn't possibly enforce them in that, in that context. You've got a strategy that actually um, was brilliant worked, and at the same time, the ministries of, of, of Bapanas, of planning and, and finance, began to seriously uh, train their people, and, and you've got at least two ministries that now today are highly competent, and you, some of the others are as well, but many still. But that whole, that educational background in the, uh, was extremely weak, as you move to the democratic system, and I think you know Professor Ayazawa's uh, presentation was extremely interesting, uh, but uh, you know, but in terms of the economy, they actually the economy is uh, is is much less coherent. It's only now under the current president that you're even getting to dealing with the uh, infrastructure pro massive infrastructure problems that the country has. Uh, and it remains to be seen. Uh, the good part of the Indonesian story is that despite all those problems, they have managed to continue growing at a, not very fast, but by, by African or Latin American standards, a very decent rate. Uh, and uh, no one wants to go back to authoritarian, or uh, hardly anyone. Uh, there are a few generals that like to go back maybe, but. Uh, generally speaking, the body politic wants, is very happy with democracy, even if it, it is a, a, bit, a bit of a mess. It's not as big a mess by any means, however, as when I first went to Indonesia in 1962, and, uh, and everything was measured, as I've said to a couple of others here, everything was measured in negatives. Rubber production was going down, the inner island shipping was falling apart, you know, you know as I said to Professor I was the only thing going up was, uh, was, in, was prices. Uh, and uh, so, so I think it's a wonderful project, I think, going into this history deeply and understanding those, the way those political uh, events that were critical for the development happened uh, is something that I hope all of you, I think you have the right kinds of, the right kinds of people to do it. So I hope, I look forward to seeing the results. Thank you. So our panel has now concluded, and I think we have a fascinating array of, uh, of insights into developments in these four countries, and we very much appreciate uh, Professor Perkins uh, really pulling things together in such an effective way. So now our panelists are here. We have a limited amount of time remaining, 
And I wonder if we can uh, open it up and have some questions. I wonder if I can follow up on your question from this morning about the role of Japan in the stories you've told. Uh, uh, Dwight Perkins was talking about one way in which Japan was obviously a very big influence in terms of its model of development, very influential in the region. But what about the looking back now so imperialism, colonialism, there are terrible sides to this story, but there's also the story of in terms of the, uh, the, the end point that we're trying to get to for explaining prosperity, stability today. We notice that those countries that had long encounters with Japan are the areas that have done best in terms of the, uh, the, uh, the uh, tables that uh, Tanaka-san gave us earlier. So from your standpoint, what was that legacy? And if I can just quickly mention uh, one reason I'm so interested in this question is I just read a book by a scholar at Harvard about China who showed that in China, those areas which were the outpost of the colonial presence in China of Japan are today the parts of China where the, the Communist Party does best in terms of its performance in, in carrying out its policies, policies such as tax collection, the one-child policy, that it's in areas where the Japanese presence was greatest, that the party now is strongest and where they're most successful in, uh, in carrying out their policies. So I'm just interested if what you find uh, looking at these uh, four parts of the world. And then that uh, Daniel Koss, who wrote that book, was here earlier, but I believe he's left. Yes. <clears throat> would you like to mention? And you don't all four have to go, but if one of you would like to talk about it for your country, that would be very relevant. But would you like to? Yeah, thank you so much. Yes, at first of all, the uh, Japanese role. Uh, as you know, for China, uh, historically speaking, uh, Qin Dynasty, yes, I should learn the uh, Meiji restoration of time because Jin Dynasty had the yes uh, monarchy system, uh, and also in the Ming era, ROC also yes learned so much from Japanese uh, yes uh, modernization. Uh, as you know, in uh, uh, the first decade of the 19th century, uh, 20th century, uh, Japan won the uh, loose Japanese war. The evolution of the Meiji restoration was uh, changed so strongly. In, 18, in uh, 1880 and 1890, the uh, evaluation of major restoration was not so high, it was not so good. So, however, after the Russian Japanese war, it changed so much. Uh, secondly, uh, however, after the Second Japanese War, Japan changed to be the, the yes, negative, it was a negative uh, symbol uh, for China at the time. Uh, for, however, uh, like in the Manchuria, and other areas, Japan expo uh, made exploitation so strongly, and Japan uh, made a so strong, uh, abundant investment toward Manchuria at the time. So after 1949, the uh, so-called so big ban uh, from the Manchuria towards all over China, so many uh, yes, fa fa uh, factory facilities were, were scattered all over the, the China, and also the, some, uh, some uh, engineers uh, that the uh, factories in Manchuria were also scattered to all over the China. So uh, this is a kind of negative legacy for China after 1949. And in, uh, as you know, the, after the uh, 1978, uh, when the uh, Tong Xiaoping started the reforming in China, uh, Japan uh, yes, supported the uh, Tong Xiaoping's uh, reform policy, uh, like Shinitetsu and some uh, industries supported China and also uh, uh, gave the so many uh, technologies and the uh, way of management of the company. Uh, that was the uh, good uh, influence. However, in after 1990s, China yes adopted the other, other way from the uh, diff that did, did, that was different from Japanese way. I think so there there were so many many aspects. And also, yeah, 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 as uh, Professor uh, Parkins uh, comment. Uh, comment uh, I really appreciate your interesting uh, comments. At first, yes, Chinese uh, yes uh, system of, of its poli uh, political system, uh, as you know, a uh, Qin Dynasty uh, could control only the prefectural level, 
not to penetrate into a rural city. Yeah, so, yes, China, then it was so strong. However, yes, there were two Chinas, the, uh, yes, administrative level and the rural or you know, autonomy in the society. Afterward, the uh, KMT government, uh, yes, tried uh, entering the rural society. However, uh, KMT government, yes, failed entering the uh, society. However, CCP successfully, yes, uh, did enter uh, into the society through the uh, CCP party system and uh, PLA, People Dem uh, Liberation Army, and maybe uh, the administrative system. So Ch PLC is the first dynasty in the Chinese history to enter the Lulao, yeah, to, to control the, uh, all of these layers of society, top and uh, 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 base, basement of society, I think. So uh, yes, although there was some uh, confusion uh, but uh, uh, under the Mao period, like uh, uh, yes, uh, cultural revolution. However, P, uh, CCP government yeah, successfully uh, yes made the some a uh, all, all Chinese mobilization system yes to support the the, the uh, economic po uh, policy after the Don Xiaoping. And also, secondly, uh, sorry, oh, okay, sorry, okay, in terms of so, okay, so, uh, yeah, yeah. So, I know there's so much uh, to be said on that yeah, question. Okay. Forgive please, me for. Please, yeah, just, fortunately, we'll be having yeah, yeah. a reception afterwards, and this is one of hopefully many topics that can be explored. Okay, so please, Do we have another a shorter uh, question? And forgive me for asking a long question. Yes. Uh, well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Ask it for fast. <laughs> yes. Well, so thank you, everyone, for your presentations. Um, so I was struck by an issue that uh, Professor Tsuji uh, Tamura brought up about um, you know, economic growth in Singapore, but you also see uh, a lot of uh, the, uh, a lot of construction of public housing. Uh, you mentioned eighty, you know, eighty percent live in public housing, and eighty percent of those own uh, you know their their own apartment. So I was wondering if you could say a bit more on you know, some of these social issues that do isn't really captured by GDP growth, right? I mean, GDP growth won't necessarily tell you about the length of the working day, uh, the, you know, workers' rights, the um, affordable education, access to education, you know, things that make, you know, life in modern society um, livable and something, you know, a, a society in which we'd want to live in. Um, that's my, yeah, one question. Why don't we take one, um, one or two more questions, and then we'll let the panelists respond to any point they would like. Yes, Shen Fujihira. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I really enjoyed your presentations. Um, so um, I want to make two very general comments. So one, I think, for this project, um, I think it'll be interesting to focus specifically on the relationship between communism and nationalism in ages 20th century. Uh, you could argue that um, communism had the most success uh, in this world region compared to other world regions. Um, and so state building process, as I thought about each of the presentation, either as a uh, anti-communist state building project or state building as part of the communist regime building processes and forces. Um, that may seem to be one theme that possibly uh, ties all the cases. So that might be something, an area to explore. Um, the second thing, I apologize quickly, is that if that is the case, um, one process too seems to be the role of um, the dominant political party. And so this might be a typology that we might want to think about in terms of a dominant party-led uh, process of state building, either anti-communist or capitalist authoritarian state. Do we have a question from this side? Yes, Professor Ida. I know this, uh, this is a rare opportunity for me to meet all these busy <laughs> <laughs> Japanese professors, so let me take the opportunity to uh, ask one question to Kawashima-sensei. Um, 
you you mentioned one child policy, but do you sort of portrayed it in a sort of positive manner? But in my understanding, it's one of the worst mistakes they have made <laughs> in Chinese economic history. So, uh, what what's the origin of this child one child policy, and uh, why do you think it lasted as long as it did? Thank you. <laughs> this is a minor question, so just so you could. Okay, and let's have a final question, then we'll go through the panel. Anyone, how about on this side? Anyone this side? Okay, okay, so. Thank you, I really enjoyed each presentation, but I wonder if each Speak panel right into the microphone, okay. please. I wonder if, you, uh, if each panelist could touch on some common theme or, or common factor that cuts across the, the region. I think Japan's role is was one of them. What Maybe was? The Sorry, could you Japan, repeat? Japan's role. Uh -huh. I think uh, Asian prosperity would not have been possible without uh, the presence of Japan. So I uh, would like each of the panelists to touch on uh, some common theme or common factor that you think was important. All right. So let us now turn to our panel and feel free to just uh, uh, respond to those parts of uh, whatever you would like to say at this point, but we uh, want to stay on track. So can we begin with Professor Kawashima? Uh, thank you so much, Ita Sensei. Uh, one child policy, yes. Uh, as you know, the, uh, in 1979, the one child policy was started, but uh, at that time, there were so many uh, uh, controversy in China. Uh, but basically, uh, yes, for the Chinese development, the one China policy was evaluated so yes positively in China at the time, yeah, in 1980s, 90s. However, gradually, yes, the uh, the uh, population, the uh, yes, uh, yes, about the so yeah, well, yes, yeah, population structure was changing so strongly, and uh, also so aging problem facing was the big problem after to, to after Chan Chan Imperial maybe. Yeah, so the uh, evaluation was changing, so, so yeah, e evaluation was changed. And also Chinese scholars study, studied, yes, uh, discussing about the, yes, the, the, the whether the, the one China policy has to be ended, end, end, ended or not, end or not. So at first, the, uh, a, it's uh, so positively evaluated for the development itself. However, the Zhangzhou the period, the, the situation was changed, I think. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you very much uh, for the question. Uh, let me just respond very briefly to uh, the question uh, raised by Professor Perkins regarding how the KMT, the Kuomintang, uh, transformed itself from the tobacco of mainland China into a very successful, successful quote-unquote authoritarian regime. I think there are at least five different factors that uh, made the, the KMT different, a different kind of KMT. First of all, not all the factions came to Taiwan, so it's only the, the, the faction loyal to the Chiang Kai-shek came to Taiwan, so it, it actually much easier for, for him to uh, conduct uh, the, the party reform and strengthen the disciplinary and reduce the faction, faction conflict between them. Secondly, there's, as you mentioned, like KT Lee, uh, Li Guoding and, uh, and uh, YK in, in Chongrong, this kind of patriotic uh, bureaucrats and in their role in the economic planning is actually very important. Uh, although some of their strategy may be debatable, but they are actually very effective in, in initiating import substitution, export-oriented kind of uh, economic policy. Thirdly, uh, the experience of KMT in, on the mainland during the uh, anti-Japanese resistance war in, for example, the resource manage, management, uh, the, the National Resource Committee, uh, and others in dealing with national uh, industry like uh, China Petroleum and others, this kind of experience also very conducive to the management in Taiwan. And, and the fourthly, uh, KMT actually initiated a successful land reform in Taiwan following the, the uh, suppression of uh, Taiwan's rebellion in, in 228 and, and others, and also tried to uh, conduct the doctrine under the Sun Yes and the, the three principles of the people. So the land reform itself uh, laid the foundation for later uh, 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 the development. And lastly, uh, I think the most important factor or the critical uh, juncture is actually the outbreak of Korean War in 1950 and the, the USA, the importing of the USA and all the military and uh, 
uh, advisory and, and they come to Taiwan to help initiate all sorts of uh, infrastructure building and economic development. And uh, as for uh, Professor Farr's uh, question regarding the, the, uh, or the role of Japan in post-Taiwan's economic development, uh, there is uh, a kind of a stereotype or orthodox that uh, uh, the, the post-war Taiwan's economic development is actually built mm -hmm. on the infrastructure of, uh, uh, laid by the Japanese during the colonial period. Mm -hmm. But I, I think right now we have a much clearer and not more sophisticated understanding of this stereotype. It is actually not the uh, infrastructure per se because most of the industrial facilities were uh, destroyed during the war. Uh, uh, with, and so it's actually it's kind of an institutional accumulation. Uh, and also the, the, uh, this kind of different kind, the, the, uh, the in inheritance of the, the, the former Japanese government general and the, and the policy like the monopoly and others by the, the KMT uh, in, in the, in the, during the uh, post-war period. This is this kinds of accumulated institutional effects combined with uh, the, the emergence of the private sector uh, during the late colonial period and also uh, under uh, the, the acquiescence uh, of the KMT government during the authoritarian regime that led to uh, the, the uh, taking off of the uh, post-war Taiwan's economic uh, development uh, that, com that is different from the kind of the Korean model which is emphasized on the big companies. I think that's my understanding of that. Thank you very much. So, Professor Tim. Thank you very much. Since time is so limited, let me refer to only one <coughs> question role of Japan in development of Singapore. You know, Singapore was under the Japanese military from 1942 to 1945. Japan at that time introduced so-called Japan's local community committee organizations to Singapore. After the occupation, the government of Singapore, I mean the PAP government, I think made use of this Japan's network of Local community, local community committee to its own so-called grassroots organization. In Singapore, there are a lot of grassroots organization, but it doesn't really it actually means grassroots organization. It's a government control organization. So this is one thing I'd like to mention. Another one is in 1970s, Singapore introduced Learn from Japan campaign, especially Japan, Japanese people's work ethic, the law of unions, labor unions, because Japanese labor union member always look to the, their company. They, some, they never say too many things to the company. So Singapore government want to learn this kind of thing from Japan. So, thank you. Yes. Yes. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much for the other questions. Um, it's all very difficult, but let me just touch on several things. Um, first, uh, on the comment of uh, Dr. Perkins. Um, you mentioned about the, uh, like the education and, and I think, it was really also, I'm citing Habibi's word, um, he, why he didn't endorse, why didn't he continue the authoritarian rule? Like, like authoritarian rule is continued by mostly authoritarian rule, another, not, not necessarily a democratic uh, rule. Um, his answer was because, um, well, the Sukarno and Suharto started their governance when the literacy was below 10% or 15%, and that is exactly why they, they chose to do the authoritarian or the military style. While in the Habibi period, it was already over 90%. So there was no chance, I mean, he, he thought, he thought there is no chance that an authoritarian rule will be sustained simply because of the education. Um, and that was the, the key decision that he, he kind of decided democratization has to be real. Um, um, so, so, I mean, thinking that, mine in, 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 in place. I think Indonesian state building, I think they prioritize the, the kind of primary education over the higher education. And I, I don't know the exact history why the choice 
came through. Um, like I think in the British colonial style, you know, you, you prioritize the higher education. Dutch style, no education, <laughs> as you said. Um, but the the Republic Indonesia started, I mean, prioritized to fund the funding to the elementary school um, rather than the higher education. That is why the higher education part has to rely on Harvard. <laughs> um, so, but I don't know why that judgment, but I think it could be the part of the Japanese legacy as well. I'm, I'm sure there's both negative and positive, but the military, the, in, the fact that the Indonesian military was the, you know, the offshoot of the Japanese military, um, you know, because of the PETA. PETA is, uh, I don't have to, I shouldn't use the abbreviation. Um, so, but that was the, 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 mili the Indonesian military, uh, which was, um, perhaps swindled by the Japanese military uh, to form as a national military, which in at, later they won against the competition with the Dutch groomed military. So, so that type of education was the backbone of the um, Indonesian New Republic. And I'm not sure how much that connects, but the key decision was to put the education minister, ministry funded primary primary education system more than the higher education. I think that was the key uh, decision for Indonesia. Um, one, one, one um, so, so communism, anti-communism is also a tricky part for Indonesian history because the, the revolutionaries in the 1920s and 30s, they were all communist, nationalist, and Islamist at the same time, right? <laughs> so <laughs> it's a very difficult thing to, to make sense nowadays, but that was how it was. So there was no strong demarcation of a state building model between anti-communist or nationalist, or anti-communist or communist at that moment. Um, it became a nasty politics, whether you have to choose either or in the 1960s. So uh, Indonesian state building followed the, the kind of anti-communist um, branding. But I wouldn't say that is an anti-communist state building, because if you look at carefully about how the economic planning was made, it's very much you have, you have a synergy with the communist state as well. But, but I will point to the, the common thing that, that the, the lady has uh, raised. Um, I think the common thing, there is a general um, tendency in Asian politics from the politics of independence and revolutions until the 1960s, right? I think that was the time that Asia was at war or hot, right? Maybe up until 1970s. So, so at those period, the common you know, general picture is Asia's purpose of politics is independent, revolution. You know, I think those are the key words. So you see these leaders talking about revolutions, you know, you know uh, and all those kind of you know, words. And you can see it from the 1955 Bandung Conference, you know, how, how all the wordings that they use at that time. But if you look at the 1970s, 80s, it's very much on development, right? Regardless of whether you are one party system or a public or a kingdom, it's development, right? Um, so making sure the purpose of politics is development in whatever political system. I think that trend from the 60s up until the 80s, I think that is the kind of common uh, trend. How to do it, it has a different style and different sequence in every country we need to kind of examine a little bit more. But I think if you want to touch upon the commonalities, I think we could draw a kind of a picture from revolution to development here. Yeah, thank, thank you. you so much. It's been a rare opportunity to have presentations on China, Taiwan, Singapore, and Indonesia in a common framework set by <coughs> Professor Tanaka at the beginning. So this has been a very, very stimulating day, and we congratulate you on this fascinating project, an important project that you're engaged in. I want to thank uh, JIIA and thank uh, Nakayama-san for bringing this delegation and giving us the honor of being the host with you of this event. Thank you. Thank you. And in closing, let me thank the staff members who have really uh,
put so much work into making this uh, event successful, from JIIA, Kensuke Yanagida, and Oyomi uh, Okubo. Oh, you, there you are. Thank you. <laughs> and from the U.S.-Japan program, Shen Fujihira, who's now gone. <laughs> <laughs> and Jenny Ting, Kendall Kelly, and Nina Combs have all contributed to making this a success. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>